Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're going through the Gospel of John here on Scripture Verse by Verse, and we come today to John chapter 16, verse 22. Remember, you can study the whole Bible with me verse by verse at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can study the Bible in its entirety with me. There are four series going through the Bible verse by verse, and you just click and listen. That's all you have to do. Bring your Bible, and that's all you need to bring to the Bible, verse by verse dot com. <clears throat> well, let's pray and get into today's verse by verse study. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin our reading in um, verse 20. We covered this first last time, but I think we need to read it. Jesus said, Verily, verily, he's talking to his apostles. I say unto you, ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Jesus is saying, living for Christ is going to be worth it. And the hatred and the hard times and the betrayal and the sacrifice that you may be asked to endure by God for living for Christ and speaking the truth bluntly without watering it down, with authority, will be worth it. It will be worth it when we see Jesus for the first time. When we see the scars that are from that cross, then I know what we're going to wish. I know what I'm going to wish. I'm going to wish that I wish, I'm going to say that I wish I would have endured more for him than what I did because he deserves it. And as Jesus said, no one will ever be able to take our joy away. So think about it. God is offering us a real good deal. Be a Christian, live for Jesus, suffer, sacrifice, and then be extremely happy for all eternity. You see, but this day and age, you don't have to suffer and sacrifice to be a Christian. Whoever told you that is a feel-good, modern evangelical who doesn't know the Word of God. Because I don't care what country you are in. I don't care what age you're living in. Jesus said, friendship with the world is enmity against God. You cannot be a friend of the world and God. If you're living holy, and preacher, if you're preaching the pure word of God, you're going to lose some friends. You're going to lose support. You're going to lose. You're going to lose popularity. You may lose. You may lose a lot more than that. You may lose family. You may lose friends. You may lose husband or wife, son or daughter. You may. You may, you're going to lose something. You're going to suffer for living for Jesus. And those modern evangelicals who think that they have struck a balance and, they, and they've figured it out, man, they're the first ones in the history of the church to figure out how to live for Jesus and be loved by the world. 
How sickening. How disgusting. Jesus said he's going to vomit you right out of his mouth because in order to be loved and popular by the world, you got to compromise. There's no other way. I don't care what you think. That's what you're doing. But God is offering us a good deal in spite of that. Be a Christian, live for Jesus, speak the truth, suffer and sacrifice, and then be extremely happy for eternity. That's a pretty good deal if you ask me. It is a much better deal than Satan has to offer, which is sin today, be popular today, have the applause and the accolades of a huge mega church today, and then burn in hell for eternity. That's a bad deal. But that's the deal that many people have made, many Christians have made. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them, said Jesus. I know what I'm talking about because I'm telling you the word of God. 23, and in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. So Jesus is telling his apostles that he will not be around in person like he has been for the last three plus years. So the apostles will not be able to look him in the eye and ask for things. But they will be able to talk to the Father in prayer and ask him, ask him for things in the name of Jesus. 24. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. So Jesus connects the subject of prayer with the subject of joy here. Ask for things in my name so that your joy may be full. God wants his people to have joy. Even in the midst of suffering or frustration for doing things the right way, even in the midst of living in this horrible world that is just going from one level of bad to another, he still wants his people to have joy. And one of the greatest sources of joy is to ask God to do something that you know Jesus would ask for because if it is something that Jesus would ask for, he's going to do it. And when God answers yes to a prayer request, you're going to have joy. Somebody asked me a few years ago what I did for fun. You want to know what I do for fun? I study the word of God. I fellowship with Jesus through the word of God. I communicate the word of God. I share the word of God. I teach the word of God. And I get feedback from people who say, that's exactly what I needed to hear today. And I think, yeah, God is alive and well and living in our midst and ministering through us and to us by his word and by his spirit. And if that doesn't thrill you, well, then you're a lot different than me because that's how I have fun. That's the funnest thing I do. I don't know if funnest is a word, but I'll use it because it's the funnest thing I do is spend time with God. And if I can get some good fellowship along the way, that's icing, icing on the cake, as it were. 25. <clears throat> These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. God the Father is the issue. And Jesus says a time is coming when I'm going to use straight talk to tell you about the Father because God the Father is the one who conceived the plan of redemption long ago before the earth was created. So he came up with the plan of ages. God the Father came up with the plan of ages. God the, whole, God the Son implemented those plans. God the Holy Spirit promotes it. They all have a part in redemption. 
When God the Son came to earth 2,000 years ago, he put the plan into action. And for 2,000 years, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, has been teaching us through the scriptures about the Father and his plan. And he's been teaching us about the Father's way. He's telling us plainly about Almighty God. 26. At that day, ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. One of the uh, things that Christ is trying to get us and the apostles to understand is that we can feel comfortable in the Father's presence. And this was a radical, this was a radical idea back in those days because back in the Old Testament, people, even God's people who were faithful were afraid to be in God's presence. But God the Father loves us for the reason that Jesus gave right here, and that's because we love his son. Always respect God the Father. Always respect God the Father. Always be in awe of God the Father. <clears throat> but as a Christian, do not live in absolute terror of him because in Christ you are accepted and loved by the Father. He loves you because you love his son. You say, but I don't love his son. Then you're not saved. To those of us who believe Christ is precious, if you don't love Jesus, then you better repent of all your sins, get on your knees and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior and this time mean it. And you'll have a love for Jesus. It'll grow, but it'll be there. 28, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So when Jesus made plans to come to earth as a baby, 2000 and whatever, 20 some years ago, <clears throat> he bought a round trip ticket as it were, because he did not come here to stay forever. Jesus dropped out of eternity at that time and came into time to pay for our sins. And when he finished paying for our sins on the cross, then he popped back out of time and back into eternity which happened when he ascended into heaven. <clears throat> 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Now apparently the light bulb just went on in the heads of the apostles and they learned something about Jesus that they didn't know before. And they felt real good about that, too. That was exciting. <clears throat> For every one thing that we learn about God as Christians, there are probably trillions of things that we do not know. The apostles, just like us, have just begun to scratch the surface of their knowledge of Christ and of knowing him the way that we will one day know him in eternity. 31, Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. That's more that's more unpleasant news from Jesus to his apostles. I'm sure they didn't like hearing this at all. Jesus says, one of these moments coming up quickly, you're going to desert me, every last one of you. But that's okay. I'm not going to be alone because I'm with my father. Jesus always had the father. The apostles are going to panic. They're going to run away. And then... They're, they're going to take off on Jesus is what they're going to do. And they're going to leave him alone after he's arrested. But as he says here, the Father's with me. 
You know, the moment that you become a Christian, it is settled. You will never be alone again. You know that? Never. You will never be alone again, ever. Because God will never leave you nor forsake you, the Bible says. Psalm 2710 says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You may feel alone because you don't have someone physically with you, but you're not alone. God is with you. You just get in his word and pray to him and read his word and he'll communicate with you. He'll show you his presence in, that, in a very real way. 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus gives it to us straight again. He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. He says that to his followers, to his faithful followers. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus gives us straight truth. Because he does not promise people that everything is going to be wonderful if you follow him. He doesn't promise that if you follow him, if you are faithful. He gives us straight truth up front. He tells you the truth, but he lets you decide if you want to follow him or not based on reality, the way it really will be. If we follow him, then we must sacrifice our sins. But at the end of our troubles in this world, like Jesus, we will overcome by going to heaven and being with him forever and eventually living on the new earth in our resurrected bodies. I'm telling you, the way I began this message today, that's a real good deal. You can't go wrong. Out of time. If you want to be a part of this ministry, you certainly can be. You can pray for me and pray for the word of God. I'd appreciate that very much. <clears throat> and I hope you're studying the Bible with me at thebibleversebyverse.com because we need the whole counsel of God. We all do. And if you are and you take a break from studying there, go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Let's stand shoulder to shoulder and get out God's word together, the whole counsel of God, without watering it down. It's the only way to be. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.